Hey there, welcome to the Game Artist Podcast. My name is Ryan Kingsline. I am the founder of the Game Art Institute, where we train artists for the career of their lives. In this podcast, we interview amazing game artists to see what makes them tick and see how they got where they are today. So sit back, relax. I look forward to sharing their journey with you. All right, folks, welcome. Today I got with me John Griffith. Griffith sorry about that. Uh, John, tell me what you do. Uh, hi, Ryan. Uh, don't worry about the surname. I get it wrong all the time. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I'm an environment artist. Awesome. All right. And so today we were really just going to, like my goal of bringing John in was to talk a little bit about environment arts, not a little bit, but a, a lot about environment arts. And then also um, get some some kind of segues for you guys into the industry, some of the ways that you can kind of think about um, about your next step, your job. So thanks for joining me, John. Yeah, no problem. All right, tell me, uh, let's start a little bit with, um, with the job, um, which is a real big focus for me in the, in the boot camp. So um, tell me a little bit about what you worked on and what you, what a day in the job looks like. Um, okay, so a day in my job at the moment is, so today I've been working on pavements and grates that got up, go on roads, you know, like sewer drains and that kind of mm-hmm. thing. Yeah. Um, so it's kind of been a lot of sourcing textures and, uh, you know, tweaking all the values in painter and such. And then getting, getting kind of exporting all of that and then uh, vert blending that in the engine uh, and then just checking all the prefabs work together and it all looks right. Mm-hmm. And then after that, I was, well, I needed lots of sewer grates of various shapes and sizes to go along yeah. the road to again break it up um have a bit of variation so i started blocking all of that out and that's where i got to at the end of today all right um so if we were looking at one of the projects so you run the lego stuff the uh, environment for the force awakens yes yeah what is what is the work um contribute because for example i was talking to my friend melissa altabella who's at uh, sucker punch and um if we were to take an image one of the things that she mentioned is is it's kind of hard for people to know like what you work on what you don't work on you know all of that kind of stuff so if we're looking at this what's the work that um um that you do or the team does if you can give us a sense of you know how this gets produced so with with this example you've got open um i only really did the lighting the set dressing and some of the yeah the floor texturing and the world putting it all together um these kind of um walls someone had already made already so i just kind of grabbed them from somebody else's scene and threw them into my level um on things like there's the forest moon of endor level um, that's on my portfolio. I did pretty much the whole thing. So I think it really depends which is, on which one is it? It's, it's that forest one in the middle. Forest one in right here? Yeah. Yes. So this door. one I did do pretty, I think the only thing I didn't do was, yeah, the smaller trees and these, the pebble texture on the floor. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so this was, I was working on this uh, level from the beginning. So there was a lot to do and the level kept changing as it normally does. And you have to just kind of reposition things, reset dress things, um, make sure that everything works. The level was quite big. So I ended up having to split it into two scenes. So it was kind of thinking about if this happens again, what's the best, what's the quickest way of doing it? Um, well, let, let's the stop ultimate. there and, and unpack that a little bit because I want to get real granular with people to, to give them a sense of what they do and can be doing. Um, so let's start first with um, with how many people are working on an environment like this. So I, I want to know, I want to get a sense of the team and then the time frame. So how many people are generally working on this throughout the whole time like from start um, to finish? And only I'm only talking about the production artists, not the concept and art directors. Yeah, yeah. Um, so at Lego, well, the, the thing is I don't work there anymore, so yeah. I probably say 
how they do things, which is fine. Um, but I think for a level, it's only one artist per level. And okay. it was like a six to eight week turnaround. So okay. sometimes, so this one, this the end all level took quite a long time, um, probably even over eight weeks, just because of the amount of times it changed. But in things like the sci-fi hallway one you did, that was about three weeks. Okay. So it's and, a real mixed bag. All right. And the level's not just this, it's a lot of these, right? Yes. Yeah. And how so many, yeah, how, if we can give me a sense of scale and scope. So we're looking right now at a, um, at a forest scene with like three or four big trees and then uh, lots more in the distance and, the, um, and kind of a little clearing, so to speak. So how yeah. much more space would there be? Would there be 10 times, 100 times? Uh, probably about 10 times. Okay. Maybe a bit more. Um, All right. And, it, and, and, uh, yeah. Sorry, it depends on the level. In, yeah. It depends on like, how long is a piece of string. Um, the the sci-fi hallway <laughs> one was quite a small yeah. level, whereas this one is about four times as big as that one. Yeah. And you, I suppose the time... Um, you might get some more time or less time depending on the size of the level, but yeah, you don't really know that until you're in it, I suppose. Got it. And there's one artist per level, one primary artist per level. And then do you have support staff and people that come in that deal with the props or like somebody's going to do the rocks or something like that? No. So with Lego, it's everyone is sort of on their own, doing their own level. Okay, um, got it. Yeah, do so it's probably... The lighting and like end to end yes yeah so it, it's it really is hands-on um there i mean in, in every job i've had i've it's always been hands-on i've it's it, it's in a weird way it's kind of when you have artists who focus on just the props or just the environment or just the lighting that sounds great uh <laughs> but unfortunately i've never been in a job yet where i'm solely doing one thing Got it. How about optimizing, though? Are you responsible for optimizing or is somebody else going in and changing and baking the lights and things of that nature? No, that's all us as well. Um, wow. So in the end, it was um, but sorry, towards the end of my time there, it was kind of like I was building things with optimization in mm -hmm. mind. So, you know, not putting in all of the verts in the first you know, instance, at the first kind of pass of it, just kind of doing what we could and going, well, we could strip this back if we want to, but it's already quite low, so this is where I'm gonna go with, which is probably not the best way of working, but when with the, something the size of this level, it's, you know, you're, you're trying to cut all the corners you can to make it faster, make production faster, so that you can move on to the next level quicker. So if you're doing an organic scene like this and you're dealing with um, vegetation and, you know, all of the stuff and tree, tree barks and all of this. And I know this, I know the industry, this kind of stuff changes a lot. And it probably changed a lot from when you were doing this. Um, so I guess the first question is, is was there a lot of substance in this or was this kind of before uh, you just started to adapt or before any of that really became as dominant as it is today? Uh, that is a good question. I think w at the time we were moving into more of a PBR pipeline. So mm -hmm. we were just starting off in substance painter and substance designer. I think yeah. I used ZBrush for the tree bark. Um, I know that we used, you know, baked height maps for the, uh, for the ground textures and things like that. Mm -hmm. But we, it was, it was sort in, at the time, we were transitioning from a Photoshop pipeline to a right. substance pipeline. So this was the, there was a little bit of it, but not loads in this one. Got it. So if one of my students wanted to make a scene like this, um, can you sketch out the kind of the, the process a little bit? Are we talking about, um, you know, grabbing trees from mega scans? Or are we talking about, um, you know, the trees, the foliage, the fern, the grass, the moss, the fallen trees, the trunks, like, just give me a sense of how, how this gets kind of planned and built. Does that make sense? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's probably a better example on my portfolio. Um, so if you go back to the, the root, sorry, the root, 
<laughs> and then yeah. it's the uh, second from the left on the top row. The graveyard? Yes. And then if you click on the read more, um, read more, read more the yes. description, and then it's that second link. Second link. The big link here or? Mm -hmm. Sorry, yeah, the big link. Uh, and then if you um, basically, so this was a, uh, my attempt at the Art Station Challenge Shogunate, mm -hmm. New Japan one. Um, so if you keep scrolling, um, this was my work in progress thread. Mm -hmm. And uh, some of the earlier images, we can see, you know, how I went about uh, blocking the scene out. Um, so what I what I do now is I, so I, I work in Modo mm -hmm. um, and I try and, you know, flesh out as much of the place as I can. Um, you know, in the beginning. And then I take that into Unreal and then I just work it up stage at a time. So even with the plants, I'll just put in some kind of proxy geometry and I'll have a diffuse and an alpha uh, image map on that so that I get the cutout of a mm -hmm. leaf. And this is just a leaf stolen from the internet. Um, and then at least from a very early stage, I can see kind of the coverage of the foliage and how big the plants might be and what kind of, you know, leaf structure is it and that kind of thing. And that means that when I'm starting to position my cameras, I can use the foliage to kind of drive the composition a bit more. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, the more you can get in earlier, the better. Then I always try and do a, there's a, there's kind of like a, a block pass and a detailed block pass. So the block pass is just cubes, essentially, you're getting your kind of key composition sorted, but I like to take the block out one step further and put in extra details. So there's, um, so on my floor, for example, all the uh, stone slabs are at different um, uh, rotations. Uh, so they're all poking out in different angles. I had that in the block out stage so that I knew all the way through that these are gonna be at kind of random angles. And it meant mm -hmm. that from quite an early stage, you can, get more of a feeling for the entire thing, which is really important when you're doing environment work uh, because you're doing it quite quickly and quite cheaply as well. Mm -hmm. so, you know, that's kind of my process really, trying to do more of a detailed block out pass and then just kind of work it up each thing layer by layer. Um, I don't like focusing on one thing and then moving on to the next. I prefer um, trying to do get everything across the board up to 50%, up to 60%, up to 70%, etc. Okay. So that, that GIF kind of shows it quite well. Okay, got it. Um, and so here's your, your asset pack. You've got a tree, um, big tree, twisty tree. And then yeah. you've got one, two, three, four, four um, smaller trees, and then a bunch of smaller shrubs, um, a couple of different grass. Uh, and then uh, several different kind of kits to the uh, to the stone, right? Yeah. Okay, to assemble all of this stuff. How important is it that you have a kit? Um, because one of the dilemmas that we face is, you know, do you just model these things or do you have to model a kit? Um, it depends on what you're doing. <laughs> this is going to be my answer for a lot of it. It depends. Yeah. It really does. So for this environment, um, I knew that it was all going to be pretty much made of the same material um, so you know it would work better if I could have a kit of parks because I knew that I wanted uh, exterior walls and they all needed to be a certain size and, and what have you right. I also know that the ground as well so there's that one big block of tiles yeah. um, I needed to I thought well if I have one big one then I'll just copy and paste it and rotate it and that will give me the variation that I need um, I think it's good to have a kit of parts, but sometimes it's not necessary. So in my um, in my first art station challenge, the Beyond Human one, that isn't a kit of parts just because I had a fixed camera and yep. I was only making things to that camera or rather in that direction of that camera. Whereas this one, I treated it more as a, uh, a level in a game. So mm -hmm. I had, fixed entrance points and i knew that the player could enter from one end or another end and how does it look the other way around but i also wanted to match it to the concept art and that kind of one angle um, so 
the kit works better for levels, but if you're doing something which is more only going to be seen from one or a couple of angles, then maybe a kit isn't the right way. Or a kit could get you most of the way, but you'll you'll I think you'll find that you'll you might end up making more parts than you actually need. Got yeah, it. I mean, that makes sense. Yeah, it does. And, but, <laughs> um, but is it fair to say that if you're looking to build more of a world, the kit's your key to... to yes, to... yeah. If, if you are if you want to create more of a world, then yes, the kit is key. Okay. And you mentioned earlier when you were, we were looking at the sci-fi environment that um, somebody else had modeled this and you did the, the lighting. And so is it kind of common to get... Um, Hmm. to get somebody who kind of models all of these pieces or are you almost always doing the modeling yourself? Um, so in my day job, um, uh, so I will be doing, if we need something, a certain something doing like a prop or part mm -hmm. of the environment, then it's up to me to make it or it's up yeah. to somebody else on the team. Or if they're busy, then I'll take that on. Um, in, in Star Wars, so in that sci-fi corridor bit, so those assets already existed from a, another, yeah, another level. And okay. then I think the level that I worked on was created kind of mid, I want to say like midway through production or something like that, or mm -hmm. it was, we'll have this level because the parts already exist type of thing. Um, so it was quite a small thing. Um, it was added absolutely. afterwards. Yeah, yeah. So I think if you, you know, I, I think with, with a, um, if you're in whatever development and you're say playing a level and it's somebody else's, you, uh, you know, you go, oh, I could that would look really nice in my level, so I'll just take it and pop, place it in, um, right. and you know, that's it's kind of free stuff then, mm -hmm. which is always nice. Okay, that makes sense to me. How about the trees? What do you use to build trees? Okay, so all the plants and smaller bushes in the uh -huh. uh, bottom left, uh, they were handmade by me. Yeah. Um, so I used, how did I do these ones? I think I used, well, what I normally do is I use Modo and I model the, all the branches in 3D um, mm -hmm. of some kind of reference. And I'll put all of that on a board and do all my bakes on the board um, and then that's kind of my final image map you I suppose and then I'll do my actual level geometry you know based around that alpha card and then you know multiply them and stick them all together and, and that kind of thing uh, but with the actual trees for this one I use speed tree mm -hmm. um, and I at the time I uh, didn't really know how to use it so the trees could be a bit better but you know they work for this environment um uh whereas i've had time at work now to actually use bee tree and I'm, I'm a lot more confident in it and it is an incredible package and the uh, beauty of these trees was i made the base tree and then the other three were created by just pressing the randomize button so i got four pri four trees for the price of one which was pretty handy yeah that's and with AI coming, it'd be a lot more <laughs> of that, I imagine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, cool. All right. Now, with Speed Tree, is this something that you recommend environment artists to learn? And I ask because, I mean, obviously, this we it. I would always recommend we learn it, but it's expensive. Um, it's only for trees, you know. So, how important is this for beginners and? people who are looking to start their career in game arts for them to kind of master this? Um, well, I think it's always good to have the knowledge of how do I make a bush or a tree from scratch myself? Mm -hmm. I think that's very important because you could be in a studio which they don't use speed tree or they don't have licenses for it. Right. And then what are you going to do? But I am, um, I would say that now that they're doing the, um, Speed Tree Unreal 4 and Unity, and they're, I think, $19 a month. So you could learn it for $19 for one month um, mm -hmm. and kind of at least get the rope feel for the ropes or, or what have you, um, and still be able to get the, you know, 
get examples out and into engine as well, which is always great to see. Um, I think it's I think it's a good one to learn. I think um, again, depending on the studio that you're going to or want to apply for, or what have you, um, then you know the more realistic the game, the more likely they are going to be using something like Speedtree for their foliage. So if you already know how to do things in Speedtree, then that's just a, a tick on the on the application form right there. Okay. I got it. That makes sense. But I'd assume that speed tree, I mean, there's a ton of training on it. So they'd assume that you could kind of get up to speed on that. It's not necessarily, and correct me if I'm wrong, it's not necessarily like a, I, we use this word uh, force multipliers, like knowing ZBrush is obviously a big deal. Um, knowing Substance Designer, another big deal. Speed tree, same kind of deal or not so much? Um, I would say probably not so much, just okay. because it's more specialist. Right. If you uh, if you want to just do foliage, then yes, then you need to learn it. If you are an environment artist and you, you, you're a little rusty on the foliage side, then it would be good to pick it up. Um, but I think unless you're using it all the time and that's your sole purpose, then maybe you could forego learning it. As long as you learnt how to do it yourself, kind of, with your own software. I think it's always good to have an understanding of what goes into it and, and why. Um, that's always good. Um, yeah, I think it took me about a week to get my head around it. Sorry, a week, a, a working week. Um, mm -hmm. And that was me going through the documentation, writing up my own notes, uh, looking at some tutorials online, diving a bit deeper, um, into the documentation because uh, I didn't realize that you could uh, Speedtree let you, you know, make your own branches in there. And then if you do it a certain way, you basically you keep all the parts of the tree within Speedtree, mm -hmm. which um, I hadn't encountered before. And I wouldn't have known that unless I'd had the time to actually um, invest and get used to the software. So I think, you know, after a week, I was, I thought, yeah, this is, I can do this now. I can do trees. I can do these bushes. I can do plants, um, which is, you know, a real confidence boost for me, but actually it was a lot easier to learn than I thought it would be. Okay. Got it. Um, and Ken's asking, is there a lot of optimizing that he's, he's referring specifically to speed tree, um, for Unreal Engine for, is there a lot of optimizing needed once you complete your tree mesh? Um, does speed nope. tree take care of that? Speedtree takes care of all of that. Um, so Speedtree will, yeah, it will automatically do the LODs and you can specify how many LODs you want. And when you export it and uh, set it up in engine, it will, uh, it will, it will do it automatically. So we're using Unity at work. So um, I did the same thing with the trees that I made a few weeks ago and you can see the LOD, well, it tells you in, in text that it's changing lot, but you don't really notice it changing lot. That's how good the lots are. Mm. And they're all automatic. Okay, got it. To answer your question, Ken. All right, um, now I'm looking at your Beyond Human uh, piece on, um, on your art station. And one of the big issues that we face um, with environment artists, all my environment artists are, um, deal with this, is completing, you know, an entire environment and i'm looking at this and i'm like there's a lot of a lot of stuff you put together in this right yeah yeah so um what kind of advice how can artists environment artists specifically you know because character artists they have the same problem but it's for different reasons um but specifically environment artists how can we build these things or or what do we need to change in our process to help us achieve a finished result um and not have it stretch out for months and months? Um, I think planning, you know, you've got to go back to basics a bit and think about um, when you'd like to get it done, how much you, okay, let me start again, actually. Mm -hmm. I um, So I've got, I made myself a planning document and yep. um, with this, I can mark out how much time and when I can work on this, you know, particular piece, let's say. And then if I can mark all of that in and, you know, I take time off as well because we don't want to be working all the time. 
and I calculate kind of about how many hours over may t maybe two months I could actually sink into a piece of work. And then I go, okay, well, if I know I've got about, I don't know, 48 hours, then I want to pick a piece of concept art that kind of fits that kind of time frame. Um, if I, I think with, you know, there's loads of great concept art out there and it's so easy to just pick something because it looks cool and that's great. But then as you start working on it, you realize, oh, actually this environment is huge and I'm going to have to do all this detail and I, oh, I'm going to, I'm losing my interest and, and blah, blah, blah. And, um, you know, that I, that's happened to me in the past and um, it's, it's terrible, but I think you've got to be realistic with what you want to get out of whatever it is you're making. Um, again, this was for the art station challenge and um, it was a fixed timed uh, thing. I think it was six weeks in the end. And so I knew I had six weeks, but then I also knew that I didn't have six weeks because I have a full time job. So when am I going to work on this environment? So then that's where I broke down how many hours I could do during the week and um, and then kind of worked out what I needed really to have done when. And uh, and then, yeah, if I needed to work a bit later, I worked a bit later. But uh I think at the end of the day, you, you want to create a finished piece. So yeah. uh, what can you, what isn't completely necessary to that? So if you are running out of time, then what can you cut? What can you scrap and just concentrate on to just get the piece out the door? Because I think more than anything, finishing artwork is a really good policy. I think if you, especially for you know your portfolio or you're applying for jobs and such, if you've got loads of unfinished work, it doesn't really tell me anything. Whereas if you've got finished pieces, then it, it uh, well, it tells me that, oh, this person can, can actually, I can give them things and they'll finish it, which, you know, sounds like nothing, but it's actually really important. Um, so I think for me, it's planning and being realistic and, and then, you know, maybe set some smaller goals so that you stay on track, but then don't be afraid to, cut things out if you feel like you're running out of time. Got it. What do you use to schedule your time? Excel spreadsheet or calendar? How do you, how do you, what's the mechanics of that? Um, it's basically a calendar uh, from the internet uh, or rather I've got a, on my Gumroad, there's a, uh, the planning document I use, but essentially it's a calendar and I just draw in Photoshop how many hours I can do. And I use a That's one color. I'm two right now. Uh, yeah, so if you go to um, uh, if you go to gumroad.com slash graffiti, uh, which is G R I W F I T, there we go. You're gonna get it. Yeah, boom. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so it's this. <laughs> it's always good when you know you come off on your own searches. So it's free. It's totally free. Um, and so if we open this up. Here it comes. And... <laughs> Let's go. Yeah, all one megabyte of it. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Come on, where'd it go? Uh, downloads and unzip to here. Okay, where'd it go? Did it? It's better be good now. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? Uh, okay. Oh, it saved a folder. That's what it did. My download. Um, oh yeah, it always shun, uh, puts it to the top. Yeah, and it's a huge from all the student work. So, am I looking at it right here? Okay, so if you want to open the the sheet one, not the blank one, it might show you one which is filled out already or not. Oh, okay, so here we go. So this is basically just saying um, what you should put in here and, you know, that kind of thing. Okay. Um, so it's kind of, so this is what I use at the beginning of projects. So I have a project name, project goals. What do I want to get out of it? Is it I want to learn more about Speedtree? Is it I really want to 
push my um, substance designer knowledge. I want to really want to do more modular kits, that kind of thing. Just put it in there. Time frame. So I always think maybe keep things to about three months max. I think yeah. in the past, so last year I made um, five new portfolio pieces and it was a long year um, and I was going quite hard with it. But it was, I think three months is a good thing for most things. Obviously, well, there's three months on here, you know, do what you like. But I think it's always good to write down, you know, I want this done in three months. And then in this calendar bit in the middle, you basically, you put in the months and you can, you know, where I've put number one, number two, that kind of thing. So I'll put in one color, I'll put all my planned work time. So for me, that's because uh, now I only do work when I'm streaming. Uh, so I'll do two hours on Monday and two hours on Thursday. Mm -hmm. And so that's what four hours a week with me. Well, we'll, we'll go with four hours a week. Uh, so I'll put all my twos in for two hours on Monday and Thursdays. And I'll look at my actual calendar and go, when are we going away? Or am I busy on some nights? And I'll adjust this calendar to match. Um, and then I'll go through in another color and go, well, what happens? Where can I put some time in? if things are be, uh, taken longer than I thought. And then I'll go through and I'll write maybe two hours here, two hours there, and then I'll calculate all of that. Um, so then I combine those times. Well, I, I, actually, what did I say? Number of hours uh, yeah. upon completion of project. Um, oh, right, so you actually put in the, so sorry. So it's been a long time since I've actually uh, looked at this again, but yeah, I'll have, uh, planned work time in hours or days. I'll yeah. have contingency work time in hours and then the actual work time because I think it's good to look back and go, well, actually, how much time did this take? And then you can really work out if you were really realistic or not. And, you know, when you could do your future projects, what you, you know, should I, I know that last time this took longer, so maybe I'll put more time aside for that. So I think it's good for kind of thinking ahead. Um, and then I just put these at the bottom. So it's like risks. Do I need to learn new software? Uh, that's going to take time. Do I need to learn a new workflow? Again, that might take additional time. Um, reference. So if you have like a, all your reference in one place in Pure Ref or it's on Pinterest, then write it in here. And then I always think it's good to just jot down the project file path and a naming convention because say you pause work on a project mm -hmm. and then you come back to it later how are you going to know can you remember where which the latest thing was and uh where it was on my hard drive and you know we could just get rid of all that hassle by just actually just writing it down it takes three seconds um so yeah that, that's what it is and uh it's helped me a lot over the last year, well, well two years now, and uh, it's such a simple thing, but it saved me a lot of time. And also, I think getting stuff out of your mind and onto paper, and you can see clearly then when you're planning on working and when you're um, taking time off, um, mm -hmm. that it doesn't become too overwhelming when you're working on a project. Right. Got it. Okay. I love this document. Um, but how do you maintain you know, the consistency, like, you know, what if a, a planned work time becomes a Game of Thrones time? I mean, season eight's coming up, right? So <laughs> we have a real threat to our schedule. Um, I guess, you know, I'm not, in my personal time, I'm not uh, restrained by deadlines. So if stuff overruns, it overruns. If you have coursework or, a, you know, a fixed deadline, then yes, you have to factor that in. Um, I think if you're feeling like you're, you need more time, then you need to look at your environment and go, or your concept piece, your work, and just think, what what is essential and what isn't? What do I need to focus my efforts on? What could I leave? And also, you know, maybe it's good to take a break and just get other, someone else to look at your work and go, you know, this is what I'm aiming for. This is where I'm at. What do you think? Do you think I, I've got enough, like, I can push through and do this? I think it depends on your mentality, I suppose, as well. Do you mm -hmm. really want it? You'll make it work. If you know, if you, 
if you're happy to, you know what, if I just cut this, this and this, I'm still going to be happy with the final results um, and I'm not going to kill myself doing it. So I'm just going to do that. And you know, that's fine. Got it. All right. So now if we come back to this and back to this idea of how do we wrap this up now, three months, you've got this, you know, this whole thing that still sounds like a, you know, a busy three months because environments is there's so many different pieces and parts to it. Right. You've got the rubble on the ground um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but set dressing is one of those things that can just expand. Yeah. 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 <laughs> It's, um, I really love set dressing. Um, it's, I love having the library and then you get to put whatever parts of the library into um, wherever you want it. And it's, it's just lovely, you know, doing that. Um, but yeah, it's kind of like with this, I think, so you see all this rubble on the floor. I think that was maybe three kind of props. So what I did in Modo was I, created all these little bits of geometry. I knew that the camera wasn't going to be that close to them, so I didn't worry about how they looked. I was also a little push for time, so I was just kind of doing odd shapes and going, this will be fine. Um, if it's not fine, I'll change it, but this will do. Um, and then I just arranged them into different kind of piles, brought all of those in, and then just scattered them about just to see what they look like. And then in each pile, it's made up of different materials, so I knew that I was always going to get some kind of um, variation within them mm -hmm. um, and then I had these um, kind of bin bags and cardboard boxes and again I just made a couple of variations and uh, just scattered them around built them up a bit some of them are floating in midair but you can't tell because of this camera angle um, I think set dressing is really important because it makes the scene feel more grounded more real um, Yes, it can take time, but I think the payoff for having done it is is really good. I think if you had this scene and it didn't have any of the rubble or any of the boxes, it would just feel very flat. It would feel like th things were missing. Um, yeah. Okay. Did that yeah, answer the question? <laughs> it does, but I, I guess what I'm tr trying to drill down to is what are the time sucks? How can we manage this? Um, so that we can produce a result. So if I have a student that wants to produce something like this, I've had students be able to get one building, you know, and and, yeah. and ground, but you've got um, multiple buildings and you've got some depth to it and all of that. Um, so what are some of the tricks or the things that we can think about to help us kind of really expand what we're able to achieve? I mean, I guess once you got one building, you just move it over, you got the other side. Yeah, yeah. So um, with this, and you can read all about this in my um, thread as well, my challenge mm -hmm. thread. Yeah. But uh, all the buildings, this, nothing in here is a kit of parts um, because I knew that it was going to be just from pretty much one angle um, yeah. and it wasn't a playable space. I could just fake it. So all the cameras you can see are from the same direction. Mm -hmm. um, if you were going to break it into a kit of parts, then this is what it looked like. But you can see in this, you know, the image that you've got up, you can see my debris piles, and they're pretty, you know, low res, and there's, there's, you know, they're, they're all kind of different shapes and sizes. I think it's you can always put something primitive in, and it's not going to cost you that much in time. Yeah. And I think when you're you know, um, when you're close to the deadline, uh, annoyingly, it makes you work harder. It makes you cut corners, not in a, a bad way, but in a, uh, I know this is quicker if I do it like this. And, you know, that's what is really helpful in industry as well, because you've already done it. You already know that it works like this and you can get the results you want this way. And, um, but you're still managing to put more into the environment. And I think it's always good to have stuff rather than not. And I suppose it's if you're coming really up to the line, then again, you've got to think, well, maybe I can get two buildings and one opposite. I can have then like a little street. And then what can I do? Can I have some kind of uh, electrics box? You know, that's just next to uh, sorry, a cube. And then I could, you know, maybe just slap a tile and texture onto that and it'll be OK. Um, can I put some little debris around again, just primitive, 
um, knocked in, bashed in cubes and elongated rectangles or something for little bits of girder. And I think, you know, if you start with that or you have that in your block out, then you'll remember it's there. And I suppose if you have it in from an early stage, you know that I'm going to have to do that at some point. Um, whereas in this scene, I don't think I had that in until quite late on, but I knew it was coming. I um, think... there, there was a question, but I guess before I, there was one thing I wanted to unpack there because you said uh, for the electrical box, you could just, it's a square and you throw a tileable texture on. And um, this is kind of one of the dilemmas that we face inside of uh, the bootcamp is our primary, um, like say if you're in a game, your, uh, your audience, you, you're producing for the project. Right, like yeah. I, I tell all, all my students, it's just it was a week ago. I was meeting with one of the, um, I think it was the president of Turtle Turtle Rock. I wasn't meeting; I was meeting with his wife, and we all just met and hung out and had some coffee. Um, but one of the things that he mentioned was that um, uh, sometimes a lot of time the artists will work to their portfolio. That was his phrasing, and I loved it. They work to their portfolio, which means they want it to be as beautiful as possible. But he wants them to work to project mm. because it costs money for to make it beautiful and yeah. in his example is like he had if you have somebody working an entire day on shoelaces that's an entire day you just literally lost yeah you know? yeah if you multiply that decision by a team of 20 artists you know every single day there's waste like that it gets quite expensive for small studios that want to produce you know content especially with turtle rock they do you know it's just awesome you know what these guys mm -hmm. do mm -hmm. they're not they're not publicly funded or any of that stuff by um like ea so you know they need to produce on budget so you know along those lines um you know we as students we have we're we're working to portfolio so our tendency is to make everything beautiful but that makes everything slow as hell and whereas a game studio is going to be hemorrhaging cash from yeah. that kind of behavior we hemorrhage time yes yeah. so you block something out you put is this something that you do early in the process that you just try yeah. to see what you can get away with quote unquote if, if that's the right way to say uh, that? yeah so i i completely agree with um those comments I think mm -hmm. it's I want things to be perfect and that's you know that's what that's who I am I'm a perfectionist but yeah. that's not possible it's not possible in my it's sometimes not possible at work it's sometimes not possible in my personal work but at the end of the day I've done it to the you know the standard that I'd like that I'm happy with and it's finished and that's what counts and whenever I, yeah, the shoelaces thing, I seeing people who do that, I'm just thinking, you're never gonna see that. Why waste the time? Just, just leave it. Just, just leave it. Um, I think with me, with the block out stuff, if you can get it in at such an early stage, you know it's coming. You know that um, you're gonna have to make time for certain things, and it stops you from uh you know spending too much time on a one thing that you know maybe you'll see it quite a lot in the scene so in that uh in the beyond human and uh, there's a lot of brick and you know i i could have spent more time on making a really amazing brick texture but all i needed was brick so i just did a brick and there it is and then i didn't go back to it so i think when you have everything in at such an early stage, you can see how much is coming and then you really go, it's up to you then to, I suppose, go, can I put more time into this? Can I put less time into this? And kind of balancing the scale yourself. And then it's really up to you, you know, you could spend another month polishing it. You know, I see things in this environment now and I'm just thinking, oh, I could really do with just changing that or making that better. But at the same time, I'm thinking, it is what it is, and at the time, that's the best I could do in the time frame, and I'm happy, and that's the important thing. Mm -hmm. um, I think you can waste a lot of time thinking about these tiny details, and yes, they might add, you know, a little bit extra. But if your scene is miss, if you if the environment is missing like half the buildings, then you need to look at you're prioritizing the wrong things, really.
Mm, got it. All right, Ken's question. He says um, he remembers reading that you relit this three times. Was this just because you were happy with it, or how it was reading? Um, and how different would you say the previous two light setups were from the final result? Oh man. Um... So this project was my first uh, real endeavor into Unreal 4 mm -hmm. um, because so before I worked at TT, I worked in animated film and we did everything pre-rendered. So I didn't have to do anything real time. Mm -hmm. um, and then at TT, they have their own in-house engine, so which is very different to Unreal. So I was learning Unreal while also doing this project. Um, the reason I had to light and relight it so many times was because I'm not very good at lighting <laughs> or rather I wasn't back then mm -hmm. and um, I was really confused by what all the dynamic static and stationary and then what I was finding was I was building the lighting and then that was blowing out all my values and it looked completely incorrect in the bake and so I think in the end, I just stuck to dynamic lighting on everything. Uh, mm -hmm. So this wouldn't run. Um, but, you know, it got the results I wanted. And I, at this time as well, I hadn't really had any formal training, as it were, on how best to light a scene. So I was kind of just looking at the concept, putting in point lights, uh, changing the radiuses, going, changing the intensities and thinking, does that look all right? looks mm -hmm. all right and then just tweak the post-process volume on top of that um yeah so it's, it's interesting actually you can um so because i made this environment um live on stream um i've put the playlist on youtube on my channel so if you really want to see me building this um then there's about 20 videos they're about three hours each um but you'll see the development from beginning to end. Um, I don't think, I think the, the last lighting pass is on it, but I don't think the previous attempts are um, just because I did stuff offline as well. But, mm -hmm. you know, if you if you really want to see how I put something together, then that's the, the place to do it. Where but yeah, that? in answers to the, uh, so again, just on YouTube, um, okay, here you with graffiti is basically everything I do is under graffiti with two eyes at the end. Okay. It's like graffiti, but just not. It's my surname. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Fair enough. Okay. All right. So we're getting right up there at about an hour. Um, I want to open this up if you guys have any other questions. And then um, the big tips, the big things that you recommend to environment artists, things that really uh, in today's marketplace, uh, make a difference in helping people get jobs? Right, broad. Um, so I think having finishing your work, that's key. Um, I think, uh, you know, working on, I think, substance painter, designer, really nailing the PBR look. Uh, if, if you want to go into, you know, photorealistic, um, likewise, if you're going stylized, then really hone your skills that way. Um, mm -hmm. I think light, like I wish I'd done more lighting work when I was younger, so that I had, I, you know, would benefit from knowing having more knowledge now. Um, but you know, being able to light, there's, I always see jobs for lighting artists, and um, you know, there, there are jobs out there for people who are interested in lighting. And that's really great. Whereas, you know, environment artists, we're all 10 a penny now. But um, I think lighting is a really great area. Um, yeah, I think finishing your stuff, I think also um, it's great having stuff rendered in Marmoset, but I would also, you know, I, I like seeing things in game engine um, just because that's what we're gonna be working in. If you know you've got it in engine and you've got like a little gif of hey look it works then that's great it tells me that oh you've you've done it great job yeah plus tick has experience in X game engine um, yeah I don't know I think it's and yeah I suppose try not to be too much of a per perfectionist and also try not to compare yourself to other people like I find it really overwhelming going on art stations sometimes because i'm just thinking how is there this much great content coming out every mm -hmm. day 
Mm-hmm. Um, and I think the idea is just to, you know, you'll get there. You just need to work hard for it um, and keep working at it. And then it, it eventually balances out, maybe. Maybe I'm just kind of come to terms with it a bit more myself. But um, I think, uh, yeah, I think, yeah, that's it. I'd, I'd say all it's right. all right planning, finishing projects. Um, yeah, if you're going PBR, then learn that. If you're not, then focus on that. And, you know, don't worry about covering all bases and uh, you'll be fine. Sweet. Okay. All right. Well, again, John, thank you so much. And uh, everybody who's in here live with me, thank you guys for being here. And I um, hope you found something um, powerful and useful out of that. All right. Any last Great. words, John? Um, not really, I suppose. Uh, yeah, hit me up if you if you need any feedback or whatever. But um, I'm going to be so just quickly at the end that I've yeah. done Beyond Human, this graveyard scene, and then this kind of robot thing and the seaplane I all did on my stream. So I'm planning on putting those streams online on YouTube. Where's soon. your stream? Because I don't see it on your about page. Uh, it's on the Twitch logo. Oh, yeah, of course. Which one's Twitch? It's this one, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. Yes. Um, I totally missed that. All right. So they can find you so, here. Yes, yeah, and everything is linked to whatever. So I think if you just put my name into, maybe even to Google, it might link everything up. But this is where I do all my work, and it's where I, you know, if you want live feedback, I can do it. And um, yeah, all the streams and all the tutorials I've done on Twitch eventually go onto YouTube. So, you know, if you're looking to see how I make things from start to finish, then do check those out. Awesome. All right, guys, you know where to find him. John, thank you again so much for being thank here. Thank you for having your wisdom. Absolutely. All right, have a great day, guys. Great, yeah. See you soon. See ya. And you know where to find John. You got questions you want to pop in? There you go. All right, see you guys. All right, take care. All right. So I want to thank you so much for being here, for taking the time and for listening to this podcast. And I want to ask a couple of things from you. Number one, make sure you leave a comment or you rate this on iTunes, Stitcher, wherever it is that you're getting this. That's going to make a big difference in helping us get the word out and get people to know who we are. All right. The other thing is I want to make sure you know where to find us. So you can head over to www.gameartinstitute.com where you can learn about our flagship program, which is the Game Artist Boot Camp. This, this is designed for those who are really looking to move the needle on their career and really lock in that job. You may have gone to school and learned a bunch, maybe haven't learned a bunch, But at the Game Art Institute, the primary focus we have is the very specific industry skills, the triggers that you really need to hit in that job interview. What are the specific things that they're looking for? That's what we're going to be training you on. We're taking applications right now for environment artists and for character artists. So make sure you head over to www.gameartinstitute.com and apply today. That way we can have that conversation, make sure this is a fit for you, make sure that you're a fit for it. And if everything is perfect, then we will sign you up for that right away and get you into your training and start moving the needle on your career. All right. Thank you so much again for being here. Take care. Have an amazing day.